I mean, we all care. Okay. <laughs> I can wait. It's a matter of how. Confidence. It's a matter of how wrong they are. <laughs> it's, it's it's not black and white, Julia. It can be crazy. Looks like something Please get one of those. Uh, the plum thingies. Weird, right? Say in the two minutes. Sorry, those two. No, no. The doctors that are last year. So good. Yeah, it was. I like how you. Oh, it's just. Good idea. Ever. It's This one. Oh, it's really the same side. We don't want to get that. Uh, I like still, this. Wait, the, I still made money on it. I have the prune. I don't know what it's talking about. This is wrong. Okay. <laughs> I think a prune is a dried. But that's why I need some vegetables. Plums are very big. No. For you, any. Oh, maybe a prune is a dried. Like prune at search. Sure. Okay. Just tell me. Well, like, prune is also like hominem because you can like prune it. It's not a plum. Plums are you. Prune is a dried plum. Oh, is it? Yes. Oh, just the way you're like. Wow. Like, Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's a dried plum. <laughs> We're gonna all be billionaires. Let's do it. So this blanc pond, uh, see the five vert. Like the, like the I kind of like the yellow. Do you know, like mates, 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 mates. But they have this. Here's a problem. I mean, they use the uh, oh, whatever stop system. Or oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a plum. Screw. You know how it's you know, it's it's watch away. It's like it's the only, but actually, I like this a lot because this is like they take oh, it over it. It. Oh, everything's half shaking up. And I know. There's gonna be huge lines. Where? Who's your AD? Like, I want to visit some AD. I don't. I had one in San Jose. It's the Rolex 80s. Yeah, so. No, what I want, I want now celebrations one. Yeah. Bubble, uh, the bubble, the OB with the bubble. Yeah. You know, the turquoise OB yeah. celebration. Oh, look at that. 41. I want a Pepsi Jam. A lot of money. I have things to trade. Right. Yeah. I have an extra. I'm going to buy it. I have an extra. Yeah. I have two mint green on a jewelry. Oh, so I have to get one. They're hard to get. So I got two. I one from Manhattan and one from Manhattan. Really? Yeah. yeah. You get yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, <what's> <laughs> Summer 2024, you're getting there, right? Getting there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. But you don't want to Okay, guys, uh, welcome back from lunch. Uh, so we're in for a treat today. Um, this is Danny Wallace. I'm going to let him talk a little bit about um, his background uh, so you get a sense as to some of the experiences that he has. Um, we are going to be recording this, so we'll post up the lecture, the, the recording as well. Um, and remember, uh, we have the speaker write-up, which I know is kind of a quick turnaround for you. So do the best you can to uh, take some notes and stuff, and we'll put it up there, and uh, that'll be good for the guest speaker write-up. Is that still the extra credit, or is that? I say it was extra credit. Yeah. Is that what I said? Yeah. Oh, okay. That was awesome. Vanilla extra credit. I don't know what I say. Plastic. Good <laughs> <laughs> thing, though. Like, sounds like you said it. <laughs> <laughs> have a hangover. Why did I say that? No. I'm just okay. So, um, so yeah. Okay, that's right. So, if you want to, fill in, you can. Okay. Any? Uh, yeah, that's right. Because we said it's so close to the end and stuff. So. Okay, cool. So I'm we're, for no further ado. With no further ado, Danny Wallace doesn't want to work. So maybe maybe don't feel bad because it does the same thing. Yeah. Really have to try. But let me okay, see. so I'll go ahead and get started. And then yeah, I got to I got to back up. Um, so I'm going to stand here for the purposes of the Zoom camera. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My pleasure uh, to be here. My name is Danny Wallace. 
Um, uh, up until June of last year, I was a, a partner at uh, one of the big four firms where I'd spent roughly 40 years. Um, I started off in Ireland where I was born um, and spent the last 30 years here in Silicon Valley. And my job um, was essentially trying to find startup clients that we would like to have been clients of the firm and uh, essentially bring them into the audit practice. And so um, I spent a lot of time with, with startup companies, some of, uh, some of which you will have heard of. Um, so Twitter was my client when they first got started, maybe at 100 employees. Um, Uber, uh, when they were still running the black car service. Um, DoorDash, um, when they were still working out of the vet's office in Palo Alto. <laughs> still with people showing up with their dogs for, uh, you know, for, <laughs> for examination. Um, uh, Dropbox, uh, Zappos with Tony Shea and Alfred Lin, um, and a host of others that, that, uh, that, you, that you won't have heard of. But, but um, that's kind of my background. So I spend a lot of time with that firm, kind of working in this space, um, you know, trying to find uh, you know, clients, uh, the potential clients. Um, so this presentation um, is one that I've given uh, quite often, and it's really a summary of my experience working with those companies. And I've tried to pivot it um, really to people who are not um, um, accountants or from a finance background. And I started out, the, the very first um, presentation I did was at uh, Y Combinator. So we were presenting to people who, were, who weren't from a finance and accounting background, but it was essentially the bones of the presentation of the same. And it's really to let you know um, things that you should really be focused on, even if finance and accounting is not your background, if it's engineering, if it's sales, um, product development, so forth, marketing. There are certain things that as a leader in the organization, you can't ignore, you can't just delegate. I mean, obviously the CFO, is going to deal with a bunch of this, but but you have to be present at the table with a point of view. And so um, I focused on there's four main things, and we'll go through those. Um, spend a little bit of time on each of those, and it's really um, it's really a summary of where I've seen things go wrong. So I've tried to try to pivot it so that at least when when you see this or you hear this in the conversation, kind of the alarm bells go off, you know, your radar, that you're you're sort of present and you know it's something you need to be involved. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about IPOs, uh, and um, I've done, not me, but my clients have done a lot of IPOs, so I think 26 by the time I left the firm, um, so it's a lot of IPOs, we'll, we'll spend some time on that, um, and I'm going to start by, um, by talking about the current venture capital scene, because obviously that's key to all of this. Um, I have quite a few slides here, which, and I believe the slides will be available, so you'll be able to look at those. Um, your leisure if you want to. So I'm going to go through those quite quickly, but really just kind of set the scene. And I'll probably refer to some notes here as I, as I go through this deck. Um, so other things that we'll cover, uh, I'm going to talk about an account, what the accounting organization looks like um, at different stages of a startup's life. And um, we tend to be the, the, the last part of any organization to get any love and attention. It's, it's generally accounting and finance is the sort of the last thing you think about before um, you know, you, you're ready to go public or, or sell the company. And I totally understand, you know, if you don't have a product, so engineering is important, if you're not able to sell that product, sales and marketing is important. And obviously, um, you know, um, the other, other departments and other functions are very important. But accounting and finance is important. And hopefully um, I'll be able to sort of uh, illustrate that when we, when we go through this presentation. Talk a little bit about financial statements. I'm also going to spend a little bit of time on accounting controls and fraud. Uh, almost every client that I've had, certainly the, the younger ones, um, have all experienced significant fraud, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you translate that into, you could have hired, you know, five engineers, right? You know, you could have hired a VP of sales. So um, these organizations are pretty chaotic from a uh, infrastructure point of view, and it's, a, it's very ripe for, um, you know, for bad behavior. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk about some of those controls that, you know, you can easily implement to prevent a number of frauds. And uh, we'll kick it off with um, the venture capital scene right now. And I wanted to acknowledge that all of this data is coming from PitchBook, so an NBCA, so you're probably very familiar with that. You can download this report just by generally by supplying it, uh, an email address, and there's, there's tons of analysis. So I've just picked the ones that I think are, um, are most interesting. So um, as you're probably aware, it's, uh, it's not a great time for fundraising, right? Pretty tepid right now. Um, carrying on from, from uh, Q1. You can see from, see from this graph. Um, I'm still not able to explain why, but obviously during the pandemic, we hit new heights in terms of fundraising. 
So this shows all, all venture capital fundraising, um, not just the VCs that are on Sand Hill Road, but also corporate venture capitalists and real estate investors. This is everything. And it's quarterly analysis, um, roughly about 40, 40 billion uh, venture capital for, for Q2. Um, so pretty stagnant compared to the, the previous quarter. Obviously, nowhere near any of the levels that we saw during the pandemic and more akin to sort of pre-pandemic levels. So almost coming back to, to where, where we were. Um, it's, it's not, as I said, it's not a great environment for, for raising capital. The, the, the primary reason for that is there's no exit market. Right? You're probably well aware the IPO market is dead, although there's, there's been a couple of notable IPOs. But obviously, um, for this cycle to continue, there needs to be exits. right? So those funds that are realized in an IPO will get distributed to the investors, um, the limited partners. They will have more um, capital to invest in new funds. The venture capitalists then will have more money to invest in, in new companies, right? And the cycle continues. So it's kind of stalled right now. Um, and it's, it's permeating all levels of um, fundraising. So it's not just um, the uh, venture growth. So the very, you know, pre-IPO companies, it's not just late stage, which... Um, they define as um, you know, a series, uh, a series E, or D and e, C and D. Sorry, uh, series uh, C and D. It's not just um, uh, early stage, so A and B. It's not just C. It's everything now is feeling is feeling the pressure here. Um, there are about fifty thousand venture venture backed startup companies in the U.S. That's probably uh, that's more than twice what there were um, back in two thousand and sixteen. So. A lot of companies looking for capital, um, and not a great time to be to be um, in the fundraising market. So I I always like this graph because this shows um, basically valuation trends, and it's not perfect, right? It's based on venture back companies that have gone public. So, but when those companies go public, you're able to you're able to see exactly what their valuation is compared to their sales number, or their revenue number. So this is based on trailing twelve months uh, price to sales multiples. Um, so it doesn't include, it doesn't, specifically doesn't include pharma and biotech because quite often their valuations have got nothing to do with revenue number, right? But if we just look at it and accept it, the model for all of its faults, you can see during the pandemic, right, valuations were incredibly high. Right? They were roughly running at 10 times revenue. So if your revenue was, was 200 million, you, you had a $2 billion valuation. Um, and you can see what's happened here, right? In the last, in the last few quarters, those valuations have come way, way down. And so now we're probably at 5x. So during the pandemic, your company might have been worth 2 billion. Now it's worth a billion, right? Um, just to use that as an illustration. So what that means is the investor has got the upper hand now, right? Not the, not the entrepreneur, right? So the entrepreneur is not dealing with multiple offers, not um, uh, um, be able to achieve higher valuations. The balance, the pendulum has swung back to, to investors. And uh, this is a sentiment index that, that was done by Pitchbrook. I, I'm not sure of all the science that goes into it, but let's just accept it for what it is. So if it's 90, um, then better for the investor, right? If it's down towards 10, much better for the startup. And you can see the, the uh, entrepreneur was in the driver's seat, right? During the pandemic, valuations were incredibly high. And now it's swung back, right? Swung back to investors. So Danny, like, I'm sorry, can I ask a quick question on the valuation? Uh, is 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 it as mechanical as taking the revenue and multiplying it by a multiple, or is that um, the outcome from some other analysis? I, I would say it depends. To be perfectly honest, what industry you're in, there are certain industries that lend themselves to multiple pricing, like um, SaaS companies. Right? You, there's all the data you want on SaaS companies. You can point to a public company peer and say they're trading at eight times revenue. I think I'm eight times revenue. Here's my revenue. And then for others, it's much more difficult. So if you think of a biotech company that doesn't have revenue, you're obviously valuing its patents. It's, uh, but is, it, is it a question of I'll pay you 20%, I'll pay you a million dollars for 20% of the stock, and that becomes the valuation? And then it so happens to be 10 times revenue, or are they looking at the returns that, like you're saying, a bunch of different? Factors. Well, I mean, any any uh, fundraising negotiation, you have two parties with different ideas of what the valuation should be. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, obviously, once once a valuation is agreed and it's ten percent of the stock, then you can work on based on I paid you know uh, two hundred thousand dollars for ten percent of the okay, stock. Great. The company's worth two million. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So if I if I take this graph and I, I 
remember the graph we just looked at on multiples and I just I just rotate it. You can see it's perfectly negatively correl correlated to, to the to the multiples. Um, so so evaluation is very important. Um, okay, so if we look at if we, we look through each of the phases, we're gonna go through these pretty quickly. Um, but uh, seed seed run financing, so angel and seed. So it's it's down both in terms of deal count and in terms of um, value. Um, so it's a difficult fundraising environment for um, for early stage entrepreneurs. Um, the problem is that the the investors have uh, a number of options they can choose from. So what we're seeing is they're they're dragging out the valuation discussions and nego negotiation discussions, taking longer. A lot of um, startup companies, if they're able to bootstrap, they're not going for they're not going for fundraising right now because they know the valuation is going to be lower. So their hope is we'll hold on for a bit longer and get a better get a better valuation, um, less dilution to us as founders. Because um, obviously, when you do that first round, um, you get diluted very heavily, right? Because typically, you haven't factored in your option pool. So an investor is going to say you need to you need to have a set aside twenty percent for options. And oh, by the way. That's not coming out of our um, percentage, right? That's coming out of your percentage. So, um, so there's a lot of um, a lot of companies are just waiting uh, for things to improve before they'll they'll uh, get the um, The other thing I didn't say with that with that last uh, um, chart we looked at is there were a large number of down runs this quarter. So we saw maybe about 14% of all financings were down runs, and I think you, just so we're all clear what that means is. That means the valuation you agreed with investors is lower than the value your previous valuation at your previous fundraising. So a down round is not a good thing, right? Um, and I think our expectation is um, you know, that that we'll we'll see a lot more down runs in the future. So I think a lot of companies have been able to mitigate it right now by doing some layoffs, borrowing some money, so so loans, um, loan capital, and so they're not going to investors. But obviously, at some point, that's going to run out, and then. <clears throat> They're going to need to go back to the well, and they'll probably see. We expect probably to see a lot more down runs in the quarter. Is that a part of the life cycle of the startup as well? That like we were we were discussing valuation, but like when you have an idea or a patent or like the seed round, you know, the valuation is kind of from what little experience I've yeah. had just listening to people. It's like kind of like you know not not that many concrete uh, metrics to say this should be the valuation, but yeah. then if it's VC, like later on, you've started making some revenue, you have some stuff, you know, you can actually put a number on it, that it just kind of shows you how um, hopeful the initial estimates might be that when the real world hits, the subsequent ones are, are expected to be down rounds or? You would typically expect the valuations to increase every time if you're in a successful startup. Um, not to say you can, you can have a down round and not be a successful company, right? I mean, there are lots of IPOs that ended up they were down runs effectively, right from the front from the last financing. But um, generally, you would expect the valuation to keep increasing, right? And that's what the existing investors would want. Because they're going to want to bring in additional capital. It's easier for them to do that if the company's performing well and the valuation's increasing and it's on some sort of trajectory. <clears throat> this is really interesting. Um, you know, there have been a number of people talking about this for a while who kind of foresaw this coming, like Bill Gurley and Keith and yeah. people like that. So my question is more, and obviously the interest rate spiking this year made this much worse, but if you ex ex take that out of it, why didn't more people see this coming and kind of be out ahead of it, considering this wasn't really that surprising? We had yeah. such a boom time. Like you I mean, I, I, th I, I would say so my analogy would be to the stock market, right? I mean, um, you know, everyone piles on, mm -hmm. right? Valuations become so high, and then at some time it corrects, right? Um, and there are smart people that can see that. I'm definitely not one of those, but there are smart people who can see it. I think I think it's some somewhat similar here. Yeah. Um, you had a lot of late stage investors sort of hop onto the bandwagon during those um, those uh, sort of halcyon days during during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think in retrospect, we'll talk about that a little bit when you see some of the later stage financings. A lot of those companies are still sitting on a ton of cash. They were overcapitalized, you know, two years ago. My goodness, right? Um, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering at what. Uh impact the SPACs had on this? Do, and do you think that had a, a, yeah. a role valuation? Um, I, well, I mean, I think SPACs generally probably uh, had a negative impact on the capital markets, right? Um, SPACs are special purpose acquisition vehicles. So basically a reverse merger into a public shell. So it's a, it's a fast way 
I have to be careful because I had some clients that did SPACs. So I don't want to be too disparaging, but it's a fast way to go public, um, a convenient way to go public. And um, some people would say those SPACs should never have been public companies. The business would never have survived a typical IPO. Um, but you know, who's to say? Um, I think they've, they've impacted the exits, right? Which, and exits has really had a big impact as well as interest rates on the funding scarcity. So definitely, um, I don't think they were particularly successful exits for a lot of the investors, but they were still exits, right? You got some money back and, and so you were able to. So um, so this is early stage VC activity. The last one was seed and angel. Um, so this would be your A and B round typically. Um, I, I have some other stats on median and average. So but again, you can, you can see for early stage, um, uh, volumes on valuations are done. Uh, I would say the bar has gone up, right? So VCs, um, investors can be pretty choosy now when it comes to which startups they want to invest in for the first time. Um, so a little bit, some of the sim similar characteristics to what we, that we're seeing with seed, with seed and angel. Um, one of the things that's important if you're at this stage is to make sure that you, uh, you know, you're, you're quite advanced on your product development side. That will definitely help your chances and your product market fit. Uh, mix, fit sorry, um, if you're able to demonstrate some some traction there, that's going to improve your chances of being able to able to close the financing. And uh, again, this a ratio, I, I I'm not quite sure how they calculate it, but let's just assume it's it's fine for right now. So this capital demand supply ratio means for every every dollar and sixty cents that um, companies want to raise, there's only one dollar of uh, venture capital available. So you can see quite tough from a fundraising perspective. Is there um, an industry where investment opportunity is still healthy? Yeah, so I, um, I would say maybe at the, at the, the later stage one, when we, look, when we look at later stage, um, AI, machine learning, climate related companies, and some biotech stuff, right? So there are still definitely some some spots where you'll get the valuation. Thank you. Um, so here, I, I just put a little bit more information in here. Um, so I'm comparing two things here. I'm comparing uh, 2023 year to date, which is obviously six months of funding data with the whole calendar year for last year. And you can see what's quite interesting here. And it sort of lines up with what we've been talking about. The actual median capital raise right, is less than last year, right? So Companies are raising uh, the median capital raises six million dollars for uh, um, early stage. Uh, last year it was eight million, and you can see the valuations, the pre-money valuations, have come down quite significantly in this in this group. So if I was a, if I was an entrepreneur last year, I would have expected a, a, to be able to raise eight million at a fifty million dollar pre-money valuation. Now things are a lot different, right? I can raise six million at a forty million um, pre-money valuation. And we'll see that trend at all of these levels. So this is late stage. So this would be uh, C and D, uh, preferred stock financing. And um, this this um, group of companies, you know, quite impacted, right? So again, deal volume is down. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the, the, the deal value is down as well. Um, pretty strong headwinds here if you're trying to, if you're trying to raise if you're trying to raise capital. Again, it's back to um, a lot of venture firms will be deciding right now, which of my portfolio companies do I want to support? And which ones do I want to either try to encourage them to exit or figure out another strategy? And so depending on which side of the, the table you're on, yeah, you know, I think your outlook is, is quite different here. Um, the other thing that I'm imagining is happening at venture companies right now when they set up a fund and they decide how many companies they're going to invest in, they, they have to decide when they're making that first investment how much, how much they want to keep in reserve because they're going to go back and do subsequent rounds. So I'm guessing right now is they're looking at the reserves and probably figuring out, hey, I don't think we have enough in reserve for all of our companies. Let's have a partner meeting and decide, you know, which one of our children are our favorites, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably that's probably happening a lot here as well. When you said uh, preferred at this stage, is there some other class of stock that's being issued? No, it's typically preferred. So the investors get preferred stock. In A, B, C. Oh, so just different rounds. So first rounds in A, second rounds in B. 
they're see. all preferred. They're all preferred, yeah. Yeah, they have preferences. So, so the preferences would be things like um, if the company fails, we're first at the trough, right? Um, they come with dividend rights, typically. Um, now, these companies don't pay dividends, but when you get to an IPO, um, it may affect how your shares get converted into common shares. So you may also get some credit for the dividends that weren't paid. Um, uh, obviously, board board seats, you know, things like that. There's a ton of preferences, right? Employees are getting common stock, typically. Founders are common stock. Quick question, maybe tying back to some of our thinking about the different accounts. Um, if a company gets seated, let's say, with 10 million bucks, does that just sit in cash, all 10 million for the first X number of years, or do they just keep a certain amount of like working cash and then put the rest in short term? I would imagine that gets, depending on where you are, I would imagine that gets earmarked and spent pretty quickly. So, probably hiring would be the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Hiring or maybe spending some money with Google, Facebook, and Amazon and Microsoft for your web hosting. Yeah. That money typically typically goes very very quickly at this stage once they get to the ipo and they have a wall chest from the ipo then they get into treasury management and they start buying things like um, mortgage-backed securities now it's a joke yeah. <laughs> 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 literally just cash and you're just that, that cash is gone i worried about yeah, that cash that cash doesn't sit there for very long um yeah and they could purchase it depends what they're trying to finance right if they're trying to finance equipment then they would use it to purchase equipment. Danny's saying a lot of it goes towards it's hiring income, generally. So that's going to hit the income yeah. statement versus the balance sheet. Yeah. They're, they're typically spending it when, when they're having the, um, the fundraising conversations with the, with the venture, venture firms, it's typically going to be, we're spending it for headcount. We're getting, you know, we're hiring, you know, 10 new salespeople, 20 engineers, we get this you know, big VP of sales coming over and all that kind of stuff. Um, so again, here you can see this is for late stage. So if I was raising money last year, I would have expected to raise 10 million at a 63 million pre-money valuation. Now things are uh, a little worse, right? I'm raising 7 million at a 55 million okay. pre-money valuation. So it's just a point of clarification. Um, the the pre-money value it just basically means that you're raising less and you're giving away more equity for it. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 You'll be, your dilution will suffer, right, if the valuation goes down. Okay, so then this is uh, venture growth. So this is sort of pre-IPO. Um, this is sort of the pre-IPO uh, group of companies. Um, and so you can see this is this number is a little distorted because this includes Stripe. And Stripe did that $6.1 billion investment. So if you pull out Stripe, <laughs> um, 13 billion for I think six billion this quarter, seven billion last quarter, something like that. So, so not great. This is the group that's most impacted by the lack of exits, right? I think there were um, only 13 billion. Um, sorry, I think there were for exits. Bear with me, 12 billion in exit value in the first half of 2023. So. There's a ton of uh, pressure at this level here. You know, um, they're sitting on a ton of trapped capital. Right? They can't take this capital to the market. Right? It's all sitting in here. Maybe there's about 200 companies that are ready to go public if the market would open up. And again, this one's really impacted on the valuation side. I mean, it might just be the the, the dynamics of the companies involved. And because there aren't, there have not been very many mega runs this um, this quarter, so over a hundred million dollar finances. So I can still raise ten million, but look look what's happened to my valuation, right? That's about a third. Right? So um, not a great time to be looking for capital if you're in this space, right? The other thing that's impacted this is all non traditional VCs, like corporate venture capital uh, companies, like um, you know Google Ventures, for example. Um, almost every technology company has a venture fund now. They're, they're pulled back. Crossover, crossover investors have pulled back. So all the late stage private equity firms, they're like, oh, we're just going to sit on this. We can buy public companies on the cheap now, right? Because they're, they're all discounted. So, so there is no money going in here, right? And that's really, that's really impacted, um, impacted these companies. So you really don't want to be sitting in here and desperately needing to go out and raise some money. Right? You're going to get uh, significant dilution. Okay, this is, more, this is hard to read, but um, I, I put this in. Um, those are all more biotech and pharma focused, right? Or 
Medicine's up there. So, yeah, it's a little bit. So, health and life sciences, 28% of all the dollars. So, it was a good quarter for health and life sciences this quarter compared to 17% last quarter. Um, deal, deal volume is about the same, 19, 20%. So it's not a bad quarter for life sciences, health industries. What, go back. what was the blue category? Um, business services. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's really it's really hard to read. That was business services. Okay, just a quick regional spot uh, spotlight. I always like this one because it makes me feel like I, I spent my career in the right place. <laughs> so you know, we have a good forty percent of all the value here, right? So that's great. So it's all you know. Most of it's happening here. If you include um, Los Angeles, we're probably at about half. Obviously, Boston, New York, um, DC, a little bit of activity in Austin, um, but most of it's still happening here. What is the black versus the blue? Yeah, this those are um I was gonna try and make a political comment, but I probably shouldn't yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, I don't know where the federal map should maybe it's the states they talk shit about. <laughs> I'll find that out for next time. Um okay, so this is uh this is basically the corporate corporate venture capital non-traditional investors. So it just really um backs up what I was saying about how they've really pulled back from the market. So for this year, it's 62 billion invested, 2,500 deals. Um, obviously that's only half a year, but still nowhere near what they've been doing in the last two or three years. So I would expect to see on their on their public company balance sheets, they're probably gonna start taking a bunch of write-downs on, on investments. Take a look out for that. This is exits. Um, so this would be IPOs or M&A activity. So an exit, so the, the BC basically is able to sell its interest in that company. That's an exit for the for the investor, and you can see they're basically non-existent, right? So they're not they're not getting the churn, so they're not getting the funds back in, which they're able to not able to distribute to the limited partners. You have a lot of folks sitting in uh, limited partnerships and institutions and um, pension funds, probably saying, "Oh, well, yeah, I'm not going to put any more money in. Um, I haven't had anything back in terms of distribution." So, um, so the flow of funds into Fundraising will be lower. Well, I was listening to uh, actually Chamath Palapatia and oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of, and they were mentioning this topic about yeah. this is the first time where LPs were actually calling them. Yep. And you know, kind of you know, yeah. doing their a lot more due diligence yeah. because of this. Because problem. of this, yeah. Other than even pulling money back. Yes, yes, that's a good point. I, I haven't done up charts on that, but when when um, uh, limited partners commit funds, right, they don't pay it all in at once. So I don't have any data on you know the number of calls um, the, or the number of commitments that have been reduced or, or scaled back, but you know, it's probably happening at some level. Um, so you can see no IPOs, no no very few M and M and A exits, um, and so as a result, this is the money that the venture capital firms are able to raise from limited partners. So things were great, valuations were high, everyone was wanted to be uh, you know, join the party. And obviously now it's it's much more difficult for them to raise money from limited partners for all the reasons we, we sort of discussed. But there is still a ton of um, dry powder, right? Sitting at the venture firms. So this is by um, the overhang of all the money that has yet to be spent. So raised, but not spent. So you can see there's what's that 300 billion close, close to? There's still a lot of money, but they're they're placing their bets very, very carefully, very strategically. And there'll probably be lots of conversations going on at these firms that we're, we'll never be party to where they're deciding exactly, you know, where to park their money with their portfolio companies. Yeah, we had a question. Oh, sorry. Do you know, like, the major reasons why this is happening? Well, like, at the pandemic, are people being cautious? Or... Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a bunch of things. I think, but primarily it's the, it's the exits. The, so the IPO market is dead, right? So that goes back to, you know, any number of reasons, right? The, the economy and interest rates and you know, stock market and so forth. I mean, I, it's it's. I mean, if you were if you had money to invest, you probably would have invested it in all those discounted public companies that had good businesses but were just overvalued in 2020 and 2021, right? Why would you invest in a new IPO and run the risk of you know having that stock crater at some point? Like very few of the 2020 and 2021 IPOs were able to maintain their valuation, right? 
I don't have data on that, but it, but it's I know certainly from all of my clients um, and the firm's clients. So I think there were just better opportunities, you know, for from a capital investment perspective. Uh, but if there are no IPOs, you can't recycle the money that's in the in you know in the venture ecosystem, right? So, but there is plenty of money though, which is good. And I think um, I read a couple of reports. I think maybe 2024, the IPO market's probably not going to open up in 2023. Um, you know, the, the holidays taking up a big chunk of the the rest of this year. Um, so. You know, fingers crossed. Hopefully, twenty twenty four, everyone comes out of the gate. And get quite a few IPOs. I know there's um, Cava was quite successful. The, the restaurant chain, I think, uh, Instacart might be going arm. So there's, there'll be one or two that hopefully will start the snowball again, and then everything will be great. And then we'll have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just leak tables by. Um, by category of company, angel and seed, early investor, late stage, growth stage. Have some names you all recognize there. Uh, Sequoia, not too far away. Andreessen, Silver Road, Wine Combinator, No West, NEA. All cast of characters. Um, this was actually from last quarter, but I just kept it in because I think it's it, it is symptomatic of what's going on. So for the for the first time in a decade, right, venture firms are posting losses. Right, now expect. Is the recognizing more write downs on the valuation side? That's probably not going to change um, in the near future. I need some good news. So this is a, this is the good news chart, right? So um, I don't know if you follow this on layoffs. FYI, um, so um, you, none of you are old enough to remember the list that went around in the early '90s of companies that were laying people off. But generally, it was people at those companies that would. Um, you know, publish that information themselves. And there was a website that was called, I'm not going to say the whole word, but it was called fcompany.com. <laughs> um, and uh, it was it was a, a little bit like this, but um, but you can see here. So we had that uh, we had that peak of layoffs where right? we can all name the companies. Um, and it started to slow down, which is good, right? So um, if you have a specific skill set, there's still tons of jobs, right? That's that's my experience, just from my conversations with people that um you know, are looking or I've worked with before. Um, I don't think this is going to tail off to, to these levels here um, because I do think once um, you know, it's clear where venture firms are going to put their place their bets and, and how they want to deal with some companies in the portfolio, I would fully expect that we'll still see some layoffs um, from those companies as they, um, as they, as they exit. Um, we'll see. So that was the fun bit. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to um, I wanted to just uh, give you an idea of what accounting departments look like um, as you go through each of those stages. So now we're at the we're at the seed stage. So seed and angel. Um, so a seed is um, is basically a self described as a seed, right? It's um, you're not going to have a series A, series B. It's it's a pre to the series A and the series B and so forth. But you have you have investors. You have named investors. Um, and obviously, there's the angel part, which is when you find out who your friends are when you ask them for money. <laughs> um, sometimes your family too. Um, so for seed, like a median three million dollar round, um, average four million for the, the last quarter. But it's very basic at this stage, right? So like your main your main concern as the you know the, the founder of the company um, is you want to make sure you pay the employees, you want to pay your vendors that you need to pay. You know, pay for your rent. So you're just focused on basically paying. There's no money coming in, right? You don't have a product. Um, there's no revenue, nothing to manage. So it's it's I call it basic blocking and tackling. Um, very straightforward focus. You have no systems, right? You there's no software that you that you're using for accounting. There's no CFO. Um, very very informal. Maybe maybe you're keeping a a record of everything you're doing on an Excel spreadsheet. That would be good. You'd be doing that. Um, but everything's manual, right? So it's super simple. Got the money in the bank account, and you're 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 going through that. You're trying to make it last as long as you can, obviously. So we get to um, early stage. So now we have a serious venture firm involved, and they're on the board. So they're going to ask awkward questions like, "Where are your financials? You know, can I see your balance sheet?" <laughs> so now you start to get a little bit more serious. So you're still focused on on paying employees and vendors, but the VC is asking you about how much cash you have, how, what your runway is what our spend is, what our burn rate is, all these things. So now you're, you're, you're sort of, I wouldn't say maniacal, but you're focused more on cash and 
how long is it going to last? And, uh, so you might actually have a part-time CFO. There's, in the Valley here, we're very lucky. There's a number of part-time uh, fractional CFOs that will come in for a day a week, you know, a day every two weeks, help you get ready for the board meeting. Um, there are lots of um, outsourced firms you can use for the bookkeeping aspect of this. And making sure you're on the straight and narrow from, you know, from taxes and so forth and employee filings and so forth. But it's still very simple, still very informal. Um, there's a phrase here called the closed cycle, which is um, if you're a public company, every month you're you're operating through this very well defined cycle where you'll close the financial statements and publish and publish those, close the books and publish financial statements. Here you don't really have a closed cycle. So your closed cycle is going to be you've got a board meeting coming up, and oh hell, I have not given a balance sheet and an income statement to the to the, to the board members yet. I better do that tonight. You know, and so that's your closed cycle generally. Reactive. No controls really. You know, people were spending money. They're coming and asking you, can I buy 10 laptops? Sure. <laughs> 10 laptops. You know, you've got corporate credit cards. Um, uh, very little control over, over spending. Um, when you get to the C&D, your board's expanded now. You've got some other, other board members on there. You're trying to get a little bit more sophisticated because now you have a product and there's money actually coming in, revenue coming in. So you have an accounting system, most likely. Um, you might actually even have a CFO at this point for a, for a C&D. You might have a, a full-time CFO, which is great. You're building out the accounting and finance organization. You might have hired a controller. You're starting to automate a bunch more stuff. And you're putting in more discipline around closing the books and publishing financial statements. Um, you're starting to make sure that you're complying with sales tax issues that you have to deal with. And obviously income tax, you're not making profits, but you're, probably, you're obviously filing income tax returns, state and federal. Um, but it's becoming more of a more of an organization. Now you're starting to build out your financial planning and analysis group, your FP&A group, looking at all sorts of rosy projections um, that you're presenting to. And then uh, the venture group. Uh, I'm sorry, there's another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Early stage and late stage. Yeah. I'm curious for VCs who aren't on the board, how often are you updating the financials? Who, who aren't on the board? Who maybe aren't on the board who don't have access to the board meetings. So how often oh. are you updating, sending out, you know, updates on financial, uh, um, et cetera? I think you'd do it every time you produce financials. So if you're on a quarterly cycle or a monthly cycle, you send them. Send them. Yeah, I think that's another yeah, question. Yes. In terms of the criticality of uh, developing all those systems, is it more critical for companies that have revenues necessarily or selling products than, let's say, biotechs that are just developing the product? I would I would say absolutely. Right. Right. I mean, um, you know, revenue takes you to a different level. Right. And depending on the nature of the revenue. So let's just say you're a software company and you can buy an off the shelf um, package to manage the revenue from your licensing agreements or your SaaS arrangements. It's pretty straightforward. Right. But you would still obviously need to spend resources on that. But if you're uh, one of the things I was going to talk about, if you're uh, um, like I like Airbnb example. Right. When Airbnb first started, um, they weren't involved in the payment process. Right. They would let the, the, the host sort of out with the guest, right? And they'd collect a fee, but they weren't handling um, the payments, right? And obviously, if you look at that organization today, they built a humongous platform, right? That's handling all these financial transactions, right? Um, now, if that's the nature of your business, then clearly in order to be able to expand and grow and be successful, you need to focus on making things as simple as possible for your customers and complying with all the other rules and regulations. So yeah, I think revenue definitely introduces, that's a good point, revenue definitely introduces a new level of, of uh, sophistication in the organization, right? And depending on what you're selling, it can be a major engineering effort versus buying something off the shelf. Um, so when uh, people get common stock in yeah. these companies, at which point or at which stage is liquidation preferences critical or important? Where is that factor to the either early stage later or so liquidate liquidation preferences will be negotiated by the venture firms in every round of financing you'll do, right? Um there there are no liquidation preferences that are built into um common stock arrangements. Um with employees. Is that what you no no yeah. meaning they get in the event of liquidation, they get preference for solvency and you know, yes. prior to the common stock. Yeah. So I, is that as early? That built in, like you said, is that, is that critical? Day, day one. Yeah, day one. So it's so, not in until Series A or that's that's well, it's built in the first financing agreement you'll do with the investor, right? 
So the investors want to have most investors some, will, will want some protection. Yes. Right? Uh, so they will build in liquidation preferences. Um, and um, and the other point is, I, I think I mentioned earlier, is just they will they will ask for an option pool for employees, typically twenty percent of the fully diluted shares. And so that's coming out. That's coming out of your share, not not the investor share, right? So, um, so you need to need to factor that into your negotiations for fundraising. Right? Obviously, when you're negotiating for fundraising, you'll use a lawyer. Um, and you'll probably use a lawyer who's done many fundraising negotiations, so they, they'll they will be aware of all of that. So when we get to venture growth, so pre IPO, I mean, you've basically built out the whole team. So you've got a system. Maybe you're using NetSuite. Um, maybe you're using SAP. Um, I know SAP acquired NetSuite, but maybe you're using the SAP software, Oracle, some, something, right, to, to capture all of these transactions. Um, permanent CFO, full in-house team, experience controller. You have all these disciplines on revenue recognition, uh, tax, um, international expansion. You have you have individuals within the organization that have specific knowledge and expertise in each of those areas. Um, everything's as much as possible is automated. So you're using software, digital tools for everything. Um, you're producing pretty sophisticated financial reports on a regular basis, probably monthly, and then probably weekly for some of the, you know, for some of the management teams, the reports, bespoke reports that they're using. Um, you have controls in place because you need to be control compliant when you go public to comply with uh, SOX, Sarbanes Oxley. But the, the one thing I should have said earlier was now you're starting to be like a business partner to other parts of the organization. You know, people actually want to talk to you, right? Can we get an analysis on revenue, right? Here's a deal that we have. How should we think about this from a revenue recognition point of view? What's it going to do to our financials? So you're starting to get pulled into, you know, more areas of the company and, um, you know, become a valued, a valued business partner. Um, more sophistication. So you might have, as I said, I mentioned taxes, but foreign exchange might be an issue if you're global. Um, Treasury now, maybe maybe you did a big fundraise, yeah, so you need a treasury strategy. Technical accounting is very important. Um, but really now you're up and running. So you can see how this evolves, right? And the, the key thing here is um, trying to be ahead of the curve and uh, you know getting the team in place um, you know, in time for these challenges that you're going to face. Um, that, that one about revenue is really important because if you think about like Airbnb, Uber, um, any platform company, eBay, uh, Eventbrite, um, Poshmark, all of those companies, there's no software that they can just go and buy that'll handle all the revenue transactions, right? They built that. Their engineers built that system. Um, they built it to be friendly for the customer. And then you, um, or the CFO, needs to make sure that, hey, all that information you're getting from the customer, we need to figure out how to get that off the platform into the financial statements. That's quite often the biggest challenge or what I would call sort of marketplace or short economy companies. That's really that's really critical too, because to your point, the marketplace is this yeah. high risk of fraud. Yeah. Because you have yeah. multiple parties who are trying to defraud you, yeah. right? Whether it be yeah. customers, partners, et cetera. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. And a lot of time is spent in that area. So okay, so that was that was the finance and accounting organization. Um so fundraising, I just wanted to talk about this really quickly. I, I think you'll be familiar with uh you know, primary financial statements, you've got the balance sheet, the income statement, cash flow statement, statement of stockholders equity, the statement of comprehensive income. Um, you need to have all of that stuff available. I mean, obviously, if you're going through a first round of financing, it's probably pretty rudimentary, but as you get more sophisticated and you're talking to um, later stage investors, um, you want to be able to share that information with them, the historical financial statements. You'll want finan financial projections, um, showing revenues, costs, and margins, 12 months in detail, probably, um, you know, summaries for, for later years. Um, use a fund statement. It's important to be able to explain um, what you're going to spend the $20 million on that you're asking them for. Okay, so um, so obviously you, you will think through that. Sometimes things that people forget about um, in a fundraising situation are, are some of the uh, non-financial areas, like the capitalization table. So everyone know what a capitalization table is? Yeah. Um, so it's a summary of who owns the stock, right? But the thing with startups is, and if you could look at Facebook, for example, that's a good example. Um, founders aren't always necessarily on the same page about who owes what and who was promised what, right? So you want to make sure before you're sitting down with investors that you know uh, exactly what commitments you've made as a company. 
And the best example I can give here, which is a nice example, is one of my own clients was a GoPro. Um, and the CEO and founder of GoPro um, was uh, Nick Woodman. And so um, before we got involved, Nick would drive up and down Highway 1 uh, with his cameras in the trunk of his car. Um, and he'd be selling them for cash, right, at, at you know, surf shops and so forth. And uh, um, he promised his roommate that if he ever sold the company, um, that he would give him 10% of whatever he sold it for, right? And so they're, they're, they're you know, this is a, they're really early stage at this point, right? In my head, they're sitting on a beach and they've got Corona and they're just <laughs> 10%. <laughs> um, and fast forward, right, um, a few years and, um, he took his first investment. I think he sold maybe $60 million worth of, of stock to some late stage investors. And we were actually in the office. We just started the audit. And, and this guy came in, his roommate came in <laughs> and, it, and Nick gave him a check for, for $6 million. And so I went home that night and I yelled at my kids, why can't you get a roommate like this? <laughs> but, um, and I think there was even more on top of that. I think the, the board were like, well, hey, look, the promise you just sold part of your stock, right? There's there's an overhang here, so let's just give this person a stock option agreement. And um, I think there's plenty of newspaper articles um, how much that was for that individual. So, um, but that was a nice example where where that was an oral promise, nothing written, and he honored it um, uh, without any uh, you know any coercion whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's say an early stage startup has three founders, right? Uh, and then they're trying to raise. Uh, as far as um, uh, how much equity goes to the investors? How do the three founders split uh, that equity? That, like, for example, will will founder one give away ten percent, and then founder two give away five percent? Like, is it split equally? Is it totally depends on um, how, let's say before the investor shows up, how you've decided who's getting what, right? Does the engineering founder get sixty percent, and the other two founders get get twenty uh, percent each, and then it would just be pro rata whenever that whenever the investor comes in. So I don't think the investor will say, you, you, you know, here, here's how we should do this, right? Okay, but customarily, uh, would the engineer, since he has 60%, would he give more uh, out of, of his share to the investors? Or well, would he say, I give five, you give five, and... and, and it, would, it, would be, it would be pro rata. So, if, so let's say the investors were taking 20% of the company, then the engineer would take 20% of his 60%, right? And give that up, right? And then, oh, they, and then the other one take twenty percent of their twenty. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. and that's like that's a good point though. That's the hardest, the hardest decision sometimes is how you allocate that that equity on day one, right? Who's a founder? Uh, who's a co-founder? Um, you know, that's that's where most of the. That's why you really want to have all of that done before you're you know you're going raising capital. You want to have the cap table pretty well locked. Um, so other things, uh, loan agreements, existing equity agreements, that like the, the old agreement that I talked about with uh, GoPro, um, I want to see compensation arrangements, the executives, I want to see the board composition. So not so much here, but um, I, I was helping a few companies in uh, back in Belfast where I'm, where I'm from, and they had put like 20 people on the board, right? Like just anyone who gave them any money got a board seat. And I'm like, guys, uh, the first thing that's going to happen when you go to Sand Hill Road is they're going to say fire all those directors. So if you're thinking about boards um, and pointing people on boards, keep it really, really uh, minimal, right? Certainly put them on an advisory board if you think that's someone that, that's contributed and, and needs to be involved. Um, but don't be giving out board seats because what's going to end up happening is they're probably, depending on, on what they bring to the table, probably likely to change on the first round of financing because I think venture, venture capitalists will be, well, look, I'm putting in you know, millions of dollars here. This other individual is not. So we don't have the same. We're, you know, we're not, he's not getting the same rights, or she's not getting the same rights as, as me. So, so you have to think through all of that first. Um, and I had a question. Uh, the use of fund statement um, are those subject to audit scrutiny, or not at this stage? No, not not at this stage. Is there a is there a format for that, or is is a company just like the AICPA or somebody prescribe? No, I mean, it's it's really, um, I mean, I would say maybe the cash flow statement is probably a good thing to start with, you know, where you think about the three parts of the cash flow statement where it talks about operating activities. So that would be, that's where I'm going to hire X number of people for operations. And the investing part deals with, I'm going to buy 
um, this equipment, that equipment. Um, so I would think that's probably a good place to start. It's really just a, how are you going to use the money, right? But there's no standardized. No standardized one, no, no. I just realized it's almost 1.30, right? So I'll need it. Two o'clock? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll go a bit faster. So risk of fraud. So um, like I said, most of my startups had fraud, um, some of which we found, uh, some of which we didn't, and it came out later. But um, it affects almost all, all companies, particularly small companies without a good internal control system. And so here's common fraud schemes. Um, I'm not suggesting you do these, but these are the <laughs> ones that I see. So personal expenses, which are really um, characterized as business expenses. So if you have an expense policy and you're not paying a lot of attention to it, that flight someone took to Vegas wasn't really for a conference, right? It was to satisfy their, their gambling addiction. Um, expenses never actually incurred, but submitted to reimbursement. So false expense claims. I've seen this so many times where someone, you know, they have a copy of Adobe Photoshop they did take a trip once, and they said so they have a hotel bill, and they have a, you know, have an airfare um, bill, and they just regenerate another one, and um, say they paid it on their on their on their uh, personal credit card and submit it for reimbursement. Happens all the time, and it it's it's insane because these amounts sometimes, I mean, they can be significant. So let me be, let's say five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, but why on earth would a VP or a regional manager risk their career? Um, for you know five or ten thousand dollars, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, falsifying sales to generate commissions. Um, so, you know, basically a lot of sales folks are are commissioned, um, they salary, but they're they're really incented by commission. So they'll put together sales deals. I've seen some that just never existed. Right. Um, go through the system, they get paid out on their commission, and they're gone. Um, kickback from kickbacks from vendors. Um, so this is where you're expanding globally, right? And you're going to a country you have no connection with, but you're, you're using an agent over there. Um, and so they set you up and um, you're basically paying above market rate to another company in that country. Um, and that's their brother-in-law, right? And so they split the, um, the, the profit back with the, your agent. And that happens all the time. So you have to be very, very careful, go through recognized, um, recognized uh, sources. Gift cards or incentive codes. Marketing department buys a whole ton of gift cards for distribution at a distribution at a marketing event. They get distributed at their you know their Christmas party and their Thanksgiving party at home instead. Right? So um, simple things like that. Um, laptop, mobile devices, and other assets. I had a company that was going public, um, and uh, the uh, wasn't the VP of engineering, but a senior director in engineering <clears throat> walked over to the Apple store and bought ten um, uh, MacBooks and. and uh, on his personal credit card, came back, um, submitted the personal credit card for reimbursement, put the laptops in his desk, never distributed. Got reimbursed, got the laptops out of his desk, walked back to the Apple store and said, hey, I'm returning these, can I have a credit to my, can I have a credit to my, um, my, my credit card, right? Um, I'm laughing, but it's, it's either actually more serious. So, so payroll fraud, typically a game when you're expanding really quickly and it's hard to, um, keep track physically of everyone that's working for you, you'll find that sometimes there are, there are people on the payroll who aren't working at the company. Right? So fictitious employee. So all of this stuff happens. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, we had it. Another sorry. Question. Slightly, maybe it's a little bit of a legal question, but when is it fraud and when is it not? And I guess where I'm going with that is um, maybe the, the company's management or individual to the extent that there is management, maybe it's just four people, don't have an issue with some of the practices that would somebody else would consider fraud, like... Um, so maybe it's a gray area. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there might be some of those. Yeah, yeah. There definitely might be some of those. That's why it's very clear. Fraud and there's illegal acts. An yeah. illegal act can be unintentional. Yeah. Yeah, I, fraud is specified by intent. Somebody knows they're doing wrong and they do it. Mm -hmm. That's, the the solution to this is to have very clear policies, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So that's where, yeah. So it's so there's no subjectivity, but some of these cases are are pretty black and white. Um, so here here's my advice. Uh, well, I tell my clients, minimize the number of corporate credit cards, right? So have as few as possible. Set approval limits. If you want to buy ten laptops, you need to come see me first, and I have to sign off on it. Um, Improve the hiring process. If you've hired your accounting manager off Craigslist, 
I guarantee you <laughs> some of this stuff has happened. Um, introduce segregation of duties. So two people responsible for, for the transaction. That way it cuts down on the, on the opportunity for fraud. Bring subordinates, make sure everyone's taking time off because you know one of the hallmarks of fraud is someone who never takes a vacation. So I don't know if you knew that. Uh, with the exception of Elon Musk, right? <laughs> um, uh, ads, because they, they need to keep it going, right? They need to perpetuate the fraud, right? They can't afford for somebody else to do their job for a week in case they find it. Um, add supervisor reviews, whistleblower line. So have a lot, uh, have a um, either an email address, anonymous, or, or a telephone number where people can report. Most of these, I think I said, forty percent of these fraud cases, the companies are identified by whistleblower. Can you comment? Uh, I know a lot of people about Theranos and Liz Holmes. Yeah. How did something like that continue to perpetuate for so many years and at that level? Of yeah. Over, I think, a hundred million. Yeah. No, it's amazing, right? Wire fraud. Yeah. And, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know if Theranos had a big board auditing firm. To be perfectly honest, I know we weren't. Um, so I can't. I can't really talk about specifics on that. I just don't know. Um, but a whistleblower line is a good one. Um, so I had one client. You've all heard of them, and uh, they had a, an accounting manager who they did hire off of um, Craigslist, and she'd spent maybe two hundred thousand dollars just. You know, taking her friends to see the sharks in San Jose, um, taking her mother to Melbourne and running it all through as a, um, as a as a business expense. My favorite was she she intercepted a check that was being written to one of the law firms, crossed the name of the law firm on it was for thirty thousand dollars, put in her boyfriend's name, and uh, and the check got cashed. And like, why couldn't I have had a girlfriend like that? <laughs> but um, she got caught because someone called the uh, um, the whistleblower line and said. Um, I don't think she went to Duke, right? She talks about going to Duke, like she was a Duke, but when I look at her Facebook page, there's no friends, you know. Um, <laughs> they, started, they started like diving into her and figured out that she had she had orchestrated this, this series of frauds. This was the third company she had done this at because very rare to get prosecuted, right? You have a conversation with the police and it's very serious and it gets investigated. Most of these companies, don't want to tell everyone, hey, you know, we were dumb and we had no controls and this person walked off with $250,000. I'm sorry, uh, board of directors. Um, so, um, uh, Jani, when, when you say a whistleblower line, a couple of questions, are public companies required to have? The companies are required, yeah. And yeah. whistleblower, yeah. and then what's the back end of that? I mean, there's a line where somebody- There's firm, there's, there's generally businesses that will, that will do the back end piece. So they'll hire a firm to investigate yeah. whistleblower allegations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, public companies have to have it. Uh, John's right. So um, private companies don't have to have it, but it's not a bad idea to have some way for people to um, to report something that they're not comfortable with. Um, I want to talk about cyber risk really quickly because we see this all the time, and all, like all my clients would have the, the you know the phishing email. So someone would have pretended to be the CEO said, you know, sent the email to the CFO or the controller, you know, you need to wire me, you know, $500,000 right away, otherwise you're fired. Um, I mean, they all get something similar to that. And it, 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 uh, it's funny how it corresponded with if there was a fundraising, then they would get a bunch more of these, right? Because people are like, oh, you just got $10 million and we know you have no control. So let's, let's try. Um, so I actually had one, um, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. The other one is, is lower level, but actually I think more effective um, from a fraud perspective is um, you get a, a, an email or a letter from a vendor and it looks like your vendor, right? They're just, the email's spoofed. Um, and they're like, well, just to let you know, we're no longer with Wells Fargo, we're with Chase. Here's the bank account details. So if you wouldn't mind updating the master file and next time you pay us, you know, pay it into the Chase account. And it's not from the vendor, right? And so the clerk, very duly is, you know, updates the uh, the banking details, and then it takes two or three business cycles for the real vendor to go away. Well, hey, we haven't been paid for, you know, for four months, what's going on? And then by the time they figure it out, it's too late, right? So that one's very common and, I, and very effective, but it's going in at a certain level of the organization that's less likely to be identified as, as mischievous. Um, this one, um, this one is actually, uh, Ubiquity was my client. This, not my client when this happened, but not to say that I would have uh, been able to prevent it, but um, they're a very uh, profitable company. 
basically um, generate a lot of cash. Um, and um, <clears throat> they were acquisitive. They were they were um, acquiring a company, I think, in, I think it was in China um, or maybe Taiwan. And so the C CEO was there. They had an office in Taipei. And um, the CFO was here in, in, well, in San Jose. And C they, they, there was a deal that was in process. And so the, the CFO got an email from the law firm, not the law firm, from the law firm with the CEO, not the CEO, copied on the email. So spoofed emails, right? And it said, um, hey, we need, to, we need to wire some money this afternoon. Um, you know, we, we're making the first installment on this deal. It's, I think it was $14 million, $12 million or something. Um, and so the CFO knew that uh, Robert was traveling, tried to contact him, couldn't get hold of him. The email was super urgent. He knew the deal was in, in play, so he wired the money, right? If you're on the other side of that, you sent an email asking for $14 million and you got $14 million, what are you going to do? Go with the basket. Give it a shot. You <laughs> all fail the ethics class? Is that? <laughs> yeah, you're going to send another one, right? <laughs> I'm not saying I would. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there were 14 emails, oh my gosh. 14 wire transfers. And it wasn't until the FBI, who was monitoring the bank account in Hong Kong, don't ask me how, um, <laughs> called the CEO and said, Robert, you know, why are you wiring all this money um, to, to these, uh, you know, these accounts in Russia, China, Hungary, and, and Poland? And he's like, we're not wiring any money. And I'm like, you've wired $48 million, $47 million. Um, they were able to get back, maybe I think, I think they got the last wire back, which was $7 or $8 million, but it was essentially a $40 million mistake. Mm -hmm. So when I think I had a bad day at work, I think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of insurance or like any kind of thing that a business could have. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> I think there, there there is, but I think if you 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 have to you can't just default and not do any due diligence. Right, right, right. So I I'm not sure how effective it is. Right, right, right. Um, so weird. But this happens. This happens a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to say, not not financial data, but intellectual property. I had another client that was going public, um, data streaming uh, company, um, software company, and uh, I think we were like maybe two weeks away from from finalizing it, and um, got a call from the CFO and CEO one day um, saying, "Oh, some bad news. Um, somebody stole all of our intellectual property." <laughs> So they had been using a third party, a very small business in San Francisco, um, where their engineers would test the code. And so the engineers had been dumping all of the code into these silos over for months and months and months, along with other companies that were doing the same thing. And some bad actor, third party, was going in and stealing all of the code right, from not just them, but from everyone else and been siphoning off the code uh, for months. Um, and they didn't figure that out until... Um, you know, months later, just just as they were getting ready to go public. Now, the if you're a SaaS company, a software company, I mean, obviously the code's important, but the whole thing about SaaS is the code changes every day, right? You're updating it every day. So the older it is, the less the less useful it is. And plus, just having the code doesn't mean you can set up a business right away. You need all the other parts. So we had to go through some shenanigans with the SEC um, on their cyber group with FBI were involved um, and uh, ended up just putting a bunch of language into the documents so that Everyone was aware that that, that was a potential risk, um, but it's not just so. It's not just the dollars, right? It's like it's it's thinking about all the other aspects of your business and how exposed they may be. Okay, I've done a horrible job on timing, so I apologize. But here are the four areas that I wanted to talk about real quick. So even if you're not uh, don't have a financial uh, finance and accounting background, have to be involved in these. One is key metrics, which we'll talk about at the end: revenue, on the stock valuation, and taxes. So revenue, why is, why is revenue important? Well, we saw on one of those slides, right? Revenue drives valuation, right? Revenue to me is the first thing I look at to see how a company's doing. Right? It's like an indicator of the health of a company, the growth so of a company's growing. Um, you know, revenue, that would be apparent in the revenue, the revenue number. So very, very important uh, metric. It's, it drives street expectations. Obviously, what's the first thing a company reports? You know, revenues were X, you know, up Y percent. Um, so um, different revenue models. Uh, I think if you're if you're picking a revenue model, you need to make sure you're in line with your peers. 
point. So you would look at your industry peers, what's their revenue recognition, what's their revenue model. Um, I want to make sure that that's the one I'm following. Um, so you can you have cloud revenue, like Salesforce, it's ratable, right? So if you sign a contract today, and it's an annual contract, you know for the next 12 months what the revenue from my contract is. So, so SaaS is great if you're the CFO. It's, it's so predictable. You've got great visibility into what your revenue is going to be. Um, the CFO is like that. The problem with SaaS is you're at the end of the quarter, two days to go, you're not going to meet your revenue number. There's very little you can do, right? You can sign a new revenue deal, but you're only going to get one day's worth of revenue, right? Um, so it's hard to it's hard to tweak it. Right. Um, a, a traditional licensing model, where you're licensing software, um, maybe like Oracle did more of in the past, um, on premise, you can just go out and sign a new ten new software deals in the last day of the last day of the month, last day of the quarter, and meet your revenue goal, right? Those software deals will be horrible quality deals because the customer knows it's the last day of the quarter, but you have an ability to, to, to affect the results, but it's much more lumpy. So when you're thinking about what revenue model do I want, to take these things into consideration. Right? Do I want something that's ratable and predictable? Do I want something where I'm gonna be able to, um, you know, if I'm not gonna hit my quarterly results, I've got an ability to, to turn it up a little bit. Um, platform and marketplaces, I'm gonna go through an example on DoorDash, but there's a whole, um, issue there with agency and principal. So do you recognize the revenue for the entire transaction? Or are you recognizing a piece of the transaction because you're the agent, not the principal in the transaction? So think of Lyft, think of Airbnb, um, Bright, Marshmark, those types of companies. Um, and then other factors to consider, you know, commission strategy. Um, how are you gonna tie that to revenue? What systems you need to support the sales and re sales team and revenue, your legal terms and conditions. Um, if you're if you're going overseas, there's a whole bunch of export controls that uh, that you need to comply with. You need to get uh, legal advice on those. But you need to be involved in all of this, right? If if, if revenue, if even if you're not an accountant, not the CFO, you can't delegate all of this. You need to be able to explain this and understand it. Um, sorry, Dan, I know we're short on time, but it's worth, I think, noting that you can have multiple revenue streams that can fit and, different yeah. models. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, cloud software companies have both an on-premise, smaller typically, and a ratable revenue stream, so they have both. Yeah. Okay, we're going to think about pizza right now, so, we, um, so here's pizza the old way, right? So Pizza Hut, I order a pizza, it's $28.09. I pay them my credit card. Here's their what they what they're telling me they're obliged to do, right? So, um, they're going to provide me with my ordered product, my pizza, as close as possible for the requested delivery collection time. I agree to accept it, um, and then transfer of property, right? All the risks in the product does it sound good? <laughs> Shall pass to the customer on delivery. So what they're saying is, as soon as we deliver the pizza to you. We've met all of our obligations, right? We're done, right? And we can recognize revenue. And here it is. Revenue of 2028 is, re is reported when the company has met its performance obligation to the customer. In this case, when the goods or services are delivered, not when the cash is received. Obviously, they got the cash before, but they have to wait until they've delivered it. And then they're done. That's their terms and conditions, right? Now, let's think about DoorDash, right? So I order another pizza. Um, this one comes to 25. Um, Everything's going through DoorDash, right? DoorDash is the merchant of record. It's handling all of the transactions. Um, but it doesn't retain all that $25. So this is back to this concept of agency versus principal. So um, when you're thinking of a revenue model, you need to think about the performance obligations. What are you promising the customer? So for, for DoorDash, if we look at their terms and conditions, this is clause number five, and we have to, we'll read through those. Um, so DoorDash provides a technology platform, right? So it's a technology platform, it's a marketplace, connecting you with independent food service providers, i.e. restaurant, right? Um, and other products, and independent third-party contractors who provide delivery services. So they have a technology platform, that's all we're doing. We're gonna connect you with a restaurant and with a dasher or with a driver, right? That's all DoorDash is promising to do, right? Um, you acknowledge and agree, just in case you didn't understand that, that DoorDash does not prepare the food or offer delivery services. So they're being very clear. Food's got nothing to do with us. Driver's got nothing to do with us. 
We have no responsibility or liability. Um, DoorDash is not in the delivery business. Um, provides a technology platform, 